Hi everyone, Adam from RethinkX here. Thanks for joining me again. Last week I had a fun time answering lots of questions on Reddit, and so I thought this would be a good time to introduce a new type of episode to this series, FAQs and Mythbusting. So, the one we'll kick off with is nuclear power. My team at RethinkX does not think that conventional nuclear fission technology has a significant role to play in the energy disruption, or in our foreseeable energy future. Now it's fine to leave some existing nuclear power plants online, but in most cases, it's more sensible to phase them out altogether. And under no circumstances is it necessary or optimal to build new nuclear power capacity. Why? Cost. Nuclear power makes no economic sense. It is vastly more expensive than our other energy options. It really is that simple. It's an open and shut case, a slam dunk. Now, I will go into more detail here about all of the other things that nuclear has going against it. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is what matters. We can get clean energy for a small fraction of the cost and with negligible risk from solar, wind, and batteries. So it's a no-brainer, the only reason to build nuclear fission power plants at this point is for their co-benefits to nuclear weapons programs. And let's be honest, nuclear weapons aren't exactly rational. So, the details. First, we don't need nuclear power, or coal power, or any other conventional energy for baseload. My team's research and others around the world has shown that solar, wind, and batteries can provide 100% of our energy 24-7 all year long with no problem. Batteries make the intermittency of solar and wind a non-issue. Second, nuclear power is super expensive. Its risks necessitate very costly safeguards during construction, operation, and decommissioning, as well as for all of the radioactive fuel and waste, and in some cases, the cost of security alone for nuclear power can be greater than the total all-in cost of solar. The cost of electricity from a newly built nuclear power plant is up to 30 times more than from a solar plant. And it's only getting uglier with each passing year. The cost of nuclear power has risen, risen over 25% since 2010. While it, during the same time, the cost of solar power has fallen almost 90%, the cost of wind power has dropped nearly 50%, and the cost of batteries has fallen about 90%. Nuclear power is one of the few industries in history with a negative experience curve, meaning that the more we build, the more expensive it gets. And that's not because of bureaucratic red tape. It's true even in countries that have no red tape. It's because the more nuclear power plants we build and gain experience from, the more we've learned what it actually takes to make them safe. And this is when everything goes right and nothing unexpected goes wrong. And when unexpected problems do arise, they are hugely expensive. In France, for example, unexpected deterioration of some of the steel piping in the newest facilities caused extended shutdowns and required extremely expensive repairs. About half of France's 56 reactors sat idle for months as a result of this, and it flipped France from being Europe's biggest electricity exporter into being a net importer last year. Worse still, the reported cost of nuclear power is based on standard levelized cost of energy, or LCOE, methodology. But my team's research has shown that this method has a fatal flaw. It assumes that each nuclear power plant operates at full capacity for 90% of the year, and all of that electricity gets purchased and utilized. But that assumption only holds true if nuclear is a small fraction of a region's total power. Any more than that, and the difference between a region's minimum and peak demand means you are overproducing if all the plants are running full tilt. Now that's fine, 
that's fine, especially if you can export that energy, but you're not going to get paid much, if anything, anything for surplus electricity in your own region. In fact, in California and Germany, for example, wholesale electricity prices are often negative, negative, when solar and wind supply is super abundant because it's cheaper for coal and nuclear power plants to pay people to take their power than to ramp output up and down. Now, think about what that means. It means it's only going to get worse for nuclear the more solar and wind there is to compete with. Today, nuclear just gets special treatment. It gets to sell all of its output first, even if that means flushing cheaper power from solar and wind down the drain. But that just means it's even less competitive than the reported cost figures suggest. But again, the bottom line is what matters here. And the costs of nuclear power just don't pencil out. Well, the problems don't stop there. The next problem is that nuclear power requires too much water. In France, nuclear provides almost 75% of the country's electricity. But in doing so, they, those nuclear power plants are responsible for 50% of the country's freshwater withdrawals. That's equal to all other industrial, commercial, and residential water use combined. Do the math. Half for nuclear, half for everything else. And that's just electricity, not energy for heating, not energy for transportation. What if all that energy had to come from nuclear too? France simply wouldn't have enough water. And that's France, where fresh water is pretty abundant. Not every country is as water rich as France is. In the US, very few nuclear power plants operate in the dry Western states, except on the coast, because of the water requirements. Now, another thing to understand is that water for cooling depends on a large temperature differential. When the intake temperature is high, its cooling effectiveness declines. During heat waves that raise river water temperatures, nuclear power plants in Finland, Germany, Switzerland, and France have to shut down because it becomes impossible to cool them enough without returning the discharged water back into rivers at temperatures so high that they would destroy those rivers' ecosystems. The next problem is that nuclear power requires wealth, human resources, and political stability to run safely. Today, 32 countries currently have nuclear power plants. The inconvenient truth is that most of the other 163 countries don't have what it takes to safely operate a civilian nuclear supply chain. And that means nuclear fission technology cannot power the world. Not until there is widespread social transformation and a huge increase in prosperity and stability in most of the world's countries. Next, nuclear power plants are scale constrained. Now, small power plants are possible, such as those on military naval vessels, but this is much much more dangerous and much more expensive than building fewer, very large facilities. And because large plants require about 10% downtime for maintenance, any country with a small population would need to be served by just a single large nuclear power plant. And so that country would then logically be wholly reliant on other electricity generation capacity or electricity imports for over a month of every year. Next, nuclear fission technology carries inherent risks of nuclear weapons material and technology proliferation. This is already a serious security challenge today. So imagine how much greater that challenge would be if another 163 countries, many of them less wealthy and less politically stable, were also trying to safeguard all of the supply chain supporting infrastructure and knowledge bases of a nuclear power industry. It's literally a recipe for disaster. Next, nuclear power has notoriously long build times. Worldwide, average siting and approval time is two years and construction averages seven and a half years. So that's a total of almost 10 years. A country could be done switching 
to solar, wind, and batteries by the time its first nuclear power plant went online. Next, uranium reserves are a limiting factor. If all the world's electricity came from nuclear power, we would only have about 10 years worth of uranium based on proven reserves. And that's just electricity, not the energy for heating or for transportation, and not accounting for any growth in energy consumption. Add all of that in and there's maybe three years of uranium in proven reserves. Now proven reserves are misleading. Maybe we could 10x that, maybe we could 50x that, but it's a big if. Breeder reactors that reuse nuclear waste are possible as an alternative to that, but according to the International Panel on Fissile Materials, quote, after six decades and the expenditure of the equivalent of tens of billions of dollars, the promise of breeder reactors remains largely unfulfilled and efforts to commercialize them have been steadily cut back in most countries, end quote. So going big on nuclear would be a huge gamble on unproven reserves and unproven technology. Next, rare materials. Nuclear reactors require a lot of exotic stuff. Not just uranium, but things like hafnium, zirconium, beryllium, and niobium too. If we ran civilization on nuclear power, all of the same sorts of supply and mining concerns that solar, wind, and batteries are criticized for would apply just the same to nuclear power as well. It would simply be with a different set of rare materials. Now, my team has argued that those sorts of concerns are exaggerated and misguided anyway, but the point is, you can't rationally argue that nuclear is an alternative to solar, wind, and batteries based on concerns about material shortages. It has all of the same problems. Next, nuclear waste is still an unsolved issue after nearly 70 years. It's perhaps not as dangerous as some folks would have us believe, but it sure isn't harmless, and dealing with it safely is extremely expensive. So, what if the amount of waste worldwide grew by a factor of 20? It would become a major international environmental hazard if we were powering the world with nuclear, especially since smaller countries would need to export the waste to other places with the necessary geology for safe long-term disposal. Transport is one of the riskiest and most contentious issues around nuclear waste for that reason. And there's frightfully strong moral hazard to just dump it at sea. Next, nuclear power has serious siting constraints. Geography, natural disaster risk, water supply, and the exclusion zone requirements around populated areas are all factors that make siting difficult. And in many smaller countries, it's simply impossible. Now, small modular reactor designs might overcome some of those siting obstacles, but again, those are unproven technologies. And finally, there's the risk of disaster. The global nuclear accident rate today stands at around one per 1,500 power plant years. That means if we had 1,500 nuclear power plants, we'd expect about one significant accident per year on average. Okay, so how many nuclear power plants would it take to run all of civilization? Well, today, around 5% of all of our energy comes from 436 nuclear power plants. To get all of our energy from nuclear power, we'd need 20 times as many plants, around 9,000. Then we have to ask whether the existing energy status quo is good enough, or, whether the billions of people living in those 163 poorer countries deserve the same quality of life, and thus the same access to energy, that those of us in the wealthiest countries enjoy. If so, then we would need to at least, at least double total global energy use. So in round numbers, that's 18,000 nuclear power plants, at least, to power the world with nuclear. Well, at today's accident rate, that would be one significant accident every month. So another way to look at it is that nuclear power would need to become at least 100 times safer with only one serious accident 
worldwide every decade or so to be considered acceptable from the public's perspective. And that simply isn't plausible with current technology, especially in the less wealthy and less politically stable countries, unless we have fundamental breakthroughs. Now, sure, those technology breakthroughs could and very likely will come eventually. We'll probably crack cheap, safe nuclear fission or even fusion someday. And I will, of course, be the first person to cheer when that day comes. But in the meantime, why not build solar, wind, and batteries with no risk at a fraction of the cost instead? It's the obviously sensible thing to do. Okay, that's it for today. As always, there are links to the book and Rethink X's other publications in the description. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing and giving us a thumbs up. That really does help uh, extend the reach of our work. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And just remember, the future is brighter than you think. We'll see you all next time. Take care.